Well, as I was just introduced, my name is Lisa Parsons. I'm the managing attorney for the SSI Outreach Project at Legal Counsel for Health Justice. And with me today are two colleagues from Legal Counsel for Health Justice. Um, the Council for Health Justice currently runs three medical legal partnerships, namely AIDS Legal Counsel, Chicago Medical Legal Partnership for Children, and the Homeless Outreach Project. But through these programs, we partner with medical and social service providers to address discrimination, disadvantage, and disparities in health, wealth, and well-being across the lifespan of vulnerable populations. I have lawyers now. Oh, I'm recording. Am I not? Can you hear? Can you hear okay without the mic? I talk really loud. I don't talk really loud. I'm going to talk louder. Do you need me to stand up? I can just you think I'm okay? Okay. That's like that. Oh my God. Okay. Um, so, anyway, I'm the attorney with the SSI Homeless Outreach Project. Um, Amanda, you can introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so, my name is Amanda Walsh. I'm a staff attorney with the Chicago Medical Legal Partnership for Children. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm Sarah Hess, I'm also on that project at Legal Counsel for Health Justice. Um, I focus on kids with chronic illness um, at UIC's CHECK program. We'll talk a, a little bit more about our specific projects uh, later in the course of our presentation. I have been a legal services attorney now for almost 30 years, and I came of age in lawyering for poor people in the 1980s, in, originally in San Francisco. For the last 10 years, I've, run, I've supervised the Homeless Outreach Project in Chicago, and it was about nine years ago I came across a PowerPoint on a copy machine in an office where I was sharing space. Um, the PowerPoint regarded ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences uh, Study. I was immediately intrigued. I had, it had made so much sense out of the stories that I had heard since the 1980s on the streets in San Francisco, and I worked with people who were homeless. And more recently in Chicago, um, the, it, it so resonated um, in regards to the stories I had heard among persons who were homeless and displaced among some of the most segregated and violent communities um, in our country. ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, is landmark medical research that documented the connection between childhood exposure to trauma and negative adult health outcomes. Trauma of both child and adult is extremely pervasive and significantly impacts the lives of persons that you'll have contact with if you practice in legal services. And I don't mean just persons who have an active and current diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm talking about people who have chronic medical conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, COPD, arthritis, people with depression, and bipolar disorder, and psychotic disorders, and substance use disorders, and cognitive impairments, and learning disabilities. Research tells us that childhood and adult trauma impacts the physical and mental health of persons across the lifespan. Research has shown that trauma impacts brain circuitry, aptitude for learning and retaining information, susceptibility to illness and stress, the risk of substance abuse and misuse, and the capacity to maintain healthy relationships. All too often, the result of childhood trauma is measurable in failed educational achievement, low vocational accomplishment, involvement in the criminal justice system, unstable personal and familial relationships, high rates of disability, often chronic homelessness, and early death. Did I mention poverty? Also um, can lead to a life of poverty. The research around ACEs continues and has expanded to include related research on expanded ACEs, expanded adverse childhood experiences that includes racism, exposure to community violence, being bullied, also the concept of transgenerational trauma, trauma that's transferred from the first generation to the second, generally due to exposure of living with somebody who's impacted by trauma, and epigenetic trauma, trauma passed down to future generations through the structural changes to the genes. All the research has something to offer the legal services community in terms of understanding the effects of trauma, cultivating trauma-informed relationships with our clients, and in collaboration with clients, constructing optimum legal solutions. 
So this afternoon's panel, <laughs> moving my slides, which I'm using a computer. Okay. So our agenda this afternoon, as you'll see from the materials, is we're going to go over an overview of trauma and legal needs, practical tools for trauma-sensitive lawyering, trauma-sensitive lawyering role play, and a debriefing of that exercise. And then also talk about secondary trauma in the legal profession and tools for self-care. And we'll have an um, opportunity for question and answers at the end. So with that, let me turn it over to Sarah to provide an overview of trauma, ACEs, and additional content. Pardon? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview on trauma. Um, we're going to go into adverse childhood experiences, which Lisa mentioned. But this is not the bulk of your training. We're really trying to get to the part where we give you practical tools for adapting this science into your legal practice. Um, so YouTube it. <laughs> um, and then there are a bunch of resources at the end of the slide uh, deck that you're going to get um, if you want more information. There are great YouTube videos out there, that's why I mentioned that. And then throughout the slides, you'll see there are little cues to different uh, resources that you can follow. Great. I guess I'll just say slide. Very professional. Um, <laughs> so there are many different definitions of trauma, um, which is, of course, part of the problem. <laughs> um, but this is the one that um, is accepted by lots of folks doing trauma-informed work, whether it's advocacy, care, um, health providers. We call it the three E's. So individual trauma resulting um, results from an event or a series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual or physically or emotionally harmful, as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, uh, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So we think about um, the event, the experience, and the effects of that. Because of course, it's, it's possible to experience something and not be traumatized by it, to not have the effect last through the rest of your life. So uh, this is just something to keep in mind, and you'll see it again throughout our presentation. Risk factors are not predictive factors because of protect protective factors. Uh, which is to say that even though we're going to see a correlation, even though we'll see uh, the risk factors that can result in negative health outcomes, uh, people are not condemned to that. It's not a sentence. Um, it's not going to happen. It's a possibility, and it can be avoided when there are protective factors or factors of resilience in someone's life. So as I delve into the ACEs and the science, a little bit of science, don't get scared. Um, just keep this in mind, right? We're not saying that this is predictive of anyone's future. Uh, slide. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study um, arose out of work that uh, Drs. Felidia and Anda were doing in California. They were working with a population struggling with obesity. And what they found was that certain patients would have success, but then not be able to keep the weight off. Whereas other patients really seem to adhere to the program and have great success. Um, again, some patients just had no improvement. Um, and so they started having more in-depth conversations with their patients. And they started asking particular questions about home life and childhood um, and what they uncovered over and over again in the patients who were really struggling was that there was a history of abuse. And so they tried to control that into a study. And so they focused on abuse that was happening in the home. Um, so that was just for the purpose of the study. And we'll talk about expanding beyond that. Um, but what they, they loosely categorized it into were different types of abuse, different types of neglect, and household challenges. Um, so you can maybe tell that I <laughs> adjusted this graphic and said challenges. It used to say dysfunction. And it's really important in the trauma-informed world to try to think about how to use positive and affirmative language um, to avoid putting blame on the household, right? But here we're talking about household challenges like struggles with mental illness, um, 
if you can't see this in the back, uh, it says mother treated violently, divorce, substance abuse, and incarcerated relative. Um, going back to the left, under neglect, we've got physical and emotional neglect. And under abuse, they've looked at physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. And they found a correlation between people reporting those kinds of experiences in their childhood and negative health outcomes later in life. Um, the original study of the 17,000 Kaiser Permanente patients um, first started publishing on this in, the, in 1988. And what they, what they were looking at was, of course, a group of people with health insurance at the time. Remember, everyone didn't have that back then. <laughs> um, and so largely a white and middle class, fairly privileged group of people reporting very high numbers of ACEs and then reporting a correlation in negative health outcomes. Uh, so, the other thing to take away from this is that it's very common. Um, a number of states have done different purpose studies trying to track this, the prevalence of ACEs in their communities. Um, but very often you see that 50% of the nation's children have experienced at least one or more types of serious childhood traumas. Slide. And so what they found and what the science has since confirmed um, from their hypothesis in the study was that adverse childhood experiences result in disrupted neurodevelopment, which results in social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, which results in adoption of uh, risky health behaviors, which can result in disease, disability, and social problems, and ultimately higher mortality rates. Next slide. Can you go back? Um, the other sort of overlay and another concept of trauma that we want to think about in terms of that pyramid uh, that we just looked at is also historical trauma. Um, so Maria Yellowhurst Braveheart um, has this beautiful definition of historical trauma. The cumulative and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from massive group trauma experience. And so when you layer the notions of early childhood um, adversity with also historical trauma that, it, that also includes the intergenerational trauma that Lisa mentioned in the opening, um, we need to think about it more carefully in terms of race equity. Um, so a response to historical trauma can be unresolved frequent anger, which in turn contributes to these physical and behavioral health disorders. So we're constantly seeing a connection and a correlation between these experiences of the child and in your community and what, of course, we can also call social determinants of health, and your adult health. Slide. So I mentioned expanded ACEs. Um, these are just a few. So the original study was focused on the home um, and what could be controlled for in that study. But since, um, since then, the trauma-informed community has really talked about expanded ACEs and also trauma generally, which is why we started with the trauma definition. It's rooted in this study, but we really take it beyond to understand our clients. So experiencing homelessness and severe poverty, being a refugee, witnessing community violence, um, bullying, as Lisa mentioned, having a history with foster care, and then finally toxic stress, which is yet another layer, right? So we're not going down the rabbit hole today, um, but these are different uh, concepts to key to um, if you're interested. Toxic stress is strong, frequent, or prolonged activation of the body's stress response systems in the absence of the buffering protection of the supportive adult relationship. That buffering, supportive adult relationship is one of the protective factors that we're constantly looking for in serving our clients. Um, you think about, for instance, a child in foster care. Um, not having a protective adult in that situation and constantly being on high alert and being hypervigilant and expecting danger um, and trying to survive. That's sort of the classic example of toxic stress. So what we see from all of this, again, is some specific uh, outcomes and correlations. So here we have a slide that shows, and this is from the ACE interface down in the bottom right corner if you're looking for more resources. Um, showing that, uh, that a higher A score also has co-occurring behaviors and conditions as outcomes. You can read through this list 
um, which are largely grouped here on the right side into affect regulation, somatic issues, substance use, sexuality, memory, arousal, and we're going to dig into those when we talk about the practical tools for addressing them, but this is just to start triggering you to identify um, the co-occurring problems. And here, we talk a lot about adverse childhood experiences, um, but certainly we want to consider adulthood and trauma as well. And what this slide shows is that the number of ACEs correlate to the number of adult stressors, which then can predict ability or disability across the month. So for people with three or more ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, who then in adulthood are experiencing what are called these major stress categories, homelessness, incarceration, chronic illness, separation and divorce, severe depression, or work-related injury or illness. When they've got three adverse childhood experiences or more, plus one of these adult circumstances, it, can, it correlates to days of ability in the month. Um, and I always use this slide because I think about my clients who have trouble getting to doctor's appointments or have trouble getting to appointments with me. When you see the, the combination of ACEs and then adult stressors, you can see the number of times it's resulting in 15 to 30 days of disability in a month, right? Where you are unable to care for yourself, unable to get out of bed, unable to engage in hygiene and get out the door, right? So when you're thinking about patients and clients who are not showing up for their doctor's appointment or failing an appointment, right, is the language that's used. Um, you have to think about ability in coping and facing with the past. Um, so, as a reminder, again, <laughs> risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors, right? That was all the bad news, um, and now we're going to help you identify how that's expressed. So I'm going to cover uh, a little bit about the symptoms that you'll see manifest in people that are impacted by trauma. Um, Often people, uh, often trauma is not described, um, and if it is described, it's not described as trauma-related. When people do talk about symptoms, people, adults might talk about depression or anger or anxiety, um, unexplained physical pain or constant complaints about physical pain. Um, you'll see people with high risk of impulsive behaviors, inability to de-escalate, people who always um, ratchet things up and have difficulty self-soothing, um, substance and alcohol abuse and misuse, aggression and self-harm, alienation and social withdrawal. In children, um, children may be difficult to soothe because of sort of being chronically aroused, um, have general fears um, that are non-specific, a sense of sort of a foreshortened future, you know, why bother if I'm going to die, everybody I know is you know, dead or been shot, um, why bother? Difficulty with peer relationships, impulsive behavior, inability to recognize danger or consequences, and stranger anxiety or indiscriminate attachment, a close relationship um, in sort of odd circumstances. The, when you think about symptoms of, in, in my practice, when I came across the ACEs study, having worked for years with people who were homeless and had serious mental illness, you recognize that there's, there's a lot of overlap between uh, symptoms of serious mental illness and trauma. And I would, people would, I would represent people who had serious mental illness, and then I would hear, and I read their records, because um, mostly I was doing a lot of disability-related work for people who were homeless. Um, and then I hear their trauma stories, and that when I read their records addressing their serious mental illness and heard their trauma stories, there, there was, while there's some overlap in the symptoms related to trauma, um, they were often very distinct. I didn't read their trauma stories in their mental health records, and yet, and, and many people wouldn't um, divulge trauma necessarily, or didn't connect um, their poor health to trauma. Um, and on the other hand, some clients I would sit down with and say, you know, what can I do to help you today? And they would launch in to the most profound, um, um, compelling trauma story, you know, from childhood to their adulthood. So some people disclose it willingly, 
Um, some people uh, don't have any awareness about how trauma has impacted their life. Um, so how I sort of wrestled with this over the years was as I started um, moving into more uh, trauma-related research, trying to reconcile what, I, what would be in medical records, what I hear from clients, what I knew about trauma, was I, I sort of landed on these um, common symptoms um, that I put into a, a mnemonic. If you, this um, hypervigilance, low self-esteem, avoidance, isolation, mistrust, and somatic complaints. Um, if you look at what that says, H, harm to me, lames, it can, and I don't mean that to be politically correct, but harm can lame people, um, harm lames. And I would lay about it, I could sort of go over it and think about the clients I was representing and how these various symptoms manifest in their life. And again, just to emphasize, I'm not talking about um, when your clients have a current um, diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. That is relatively rare. But you will see people that manifest one, some, or all of these symptoms. And again, it's across the lifespan. So it helps really to understand um, what this person has experienced and how it has negatively impact um, their health and well-being at this point. So hypervigilance is, of course, the feeling always fight, flight, or freeze, um, uh, very anxious. Um, the low self-esteem, shame, blame, guilt, stigma, feeling powerless or helpless, <coughs> avoidance, avoiding people, places, or stimuli associated with the trauma, or a big one is uh, not able to discuss it. I mean, people that just have never been able to, uh, don't, don't divulge it to you, you may pick up on it, or once you start recognizing the symptoms, you might um, go there with a client if you think it's necessary, but they kept it so buried and so deep, um, it's really a, the symptom of avoidance. Um, isolation, when people are uh, uh, isolated or disconnected, don't have much of a family um, or peer support system. Um, mistrust, um, because naturally if you've been um, uh, traumatized, you're gonna lose um, faith and confidence in others and, and, and lack of trust. And then somatic complaints, and I would say, I have a very significant majority of clients who first manifest trauma in somatic complaints. They have a long history of seeking medical care for various physical complaints, and that's what they're fixated on. Um, but all the objective tests um, don't show that there's anything severe, but it's sort of their mental pain that's manifesting in physical symptoms. Um, so just to, to, to sort of break this down by example, I was um, doing outreach in a shelter and a middle-aged gentleman, um, the shelter staff had been trying to get him to come and see me for, for about a year and a half. And so he finally came in one day and said, all right, I know you can't help me, but um, you know they keep telling me I should talk to you. And so I'm there and I'm there to help people in the shelter who need, uh, who appear to be eligible for federal disability benefits. So in starting our conversation, he, he first emphasized that he had um, been in the, he had been wrongfully convicted of a crime and done almost 18 years in our state correctional system. And he'd been now in the shelter for almost two years. And so um, he was very, he kept apologizing to me for taking his time, right? Which sort of goes to the low self-esteem. He didn't want to bother me. He also would say things like, you know, you can't help me, you know, what, you know, why, why should I even be telling you this? There's nothing you can do for me. So there was definitely a lack of trust. Um, he, 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 so by him disclosing that he'd been in the correctional system and for he's, and based on his report, um, wrongfully convicted, that's an adult trauma. Now. And I didn't know anything about his childhood. He also reported to me in the course of our conversation though that he had dropped out of school um, between the eighth and ninth grade, actually had just done a few days of freshman year. He was very um, embarrassed about that and kept saying it was my mistake, that was stupid, I don't know what I was thinking, and just really belittled himself. Again, it went to his confidence um, and low self-esteem and self-blame. Um, when I asked him about whether he, he'd been in the shelters two years, and usually by that point somebody has uh, made a connection to a case manager or social worker or some sort of support, and um, he had none when I asked him. 
Um, and I asked if he had any family members in Chicago where he could go and just take a shower or leave his clothes or get some support or get mail. Um, he had nobody. He was disconnected from everybody um, in his family, which shows you the isolation. Um, what he came to me for, and what he, what he asked about was disability benefits based on his diagnosis of, di of diabetes, and, um, and then he had some chronic low back pain. And yet, in the course of conversation with him, there was so much more going on based on my knowledge of trauma and its impact over a lifetime. And so, in the course of my meetings with uh, this gentleman, he didn't have a diabetic condition that would qualify him for disability. It was, it was too well controlled, quite frankly. Um, but I was very concerned that he had an undiagnosed um, trauma-related mental health condition. Um, and so when I wrote that, when I talked to him about the research around trauma, when I just said to him, you know, based on the description of, of what you've been through in your life, um, you know, I'm wondering when I explored sort of why he had dropped out of school at such a young age, he just, he, he didn't want to talk about it, right? It was avoidance. It was like, that, that's something that stays in the family. And so I, I shared with him some of, some of the things we've learned with trauma research is that often when kids are in, if, if he was going through a tough time, not not you know, asking him if he did, he did divulge anything, but it sounds like things were somewhat difficult for you when you were a child. Research tells us that for children that are in difficult circumstances, you can be stuck sort of in fight or flight. And when you're in fight or flight, it's very difficult to learn. So maybe you know, uh, you dropping me out of school was a was a reasonable response to a very stressful situation. Um, or he, he also had an idea that he had maybe a learning disability. You know, and I acknowledge it'd be very difficult to learn if you were going through a lot of um, uh, challenges um, in your household or in your life during that time. So it really helped him sort of um, stop blaming himself so much. He was very interested when I shared with him the trauma research. And through additional conversations, I was able to introduce, introduce the idea of, you know, that you've gone through this difficult, these difficult experiences, and also talking about the wrongful conviction of how that can impact his, his mental health and well-being, and how being homeless can also be a traumatizing uh, experience, and how that can affect his mental health and physical health and well-being, and what about the thought of connecting him to a mental health um, outreach team who could come and help him um, better cope with his uh, circumstances, get support that he would need, and also provide useful documentation in a disability claim. So um, that's an example of somebody who didn't self-diagnose his trauma, didn't come to me with a trauma story. In fact, through the course of our representation, it was always, he was very um, unstable in terms of his willingness to acknowledge any trauma at all, but he did engage in uh, health services and we did get him benefits and he did get out of the shelter. So that's just an, uh, one example of, um, of when you're familiar with the symptoms, now that I know the symptom, I can see, um, I guess I have time for one more example. Another example of a woman that I worked with for years trying to secure disability benefits, and she was deeply um, addicted long-term to opiates, heroin. And um, I worked with, in our practice, we're not linear in our disability plans. We'll do, if people are familiar with it, this in the administrative review process, we can continue to appeal or we can put a hold on a case if we um, need more development. Anyway, with this woman, she, she, she disclosed, I knew about a very tra traumatized um, past that she had. She was in mental health care, but she was chronically, and uh, she was on methadone, she chronically was having positive tox screens for um, cocaine use and heroin um, throughout the course of my representing her. And she was also um, being prescribed a benzodiazepine medication, which is really uh, dangerous when you're on um, methadone also, and having a lot of heroin relapses. So it, it, she came to me with a lot of somatic complaints. It was like every interaction we had, it was hysteria around some new physical ailment a really sore shoulder, a bad knee, some um, other uh, physical conditions that she would get me really fixated on, and you've got to get me to a doctor for this, or you get these records, that doctor knows what's going on. And when I read her mental health records, she was often doing very sort of hysterical, uh, uh, sort of placing these demands on her mental health team to help her with these other issues related to her children or others in the community that weren't related really to her mental health. So when, um, and when I looked at my representation of this client over the course of almost five years it took us to get her from beginning to a, a favorable disability claim because of the issue of materiality of their substance use. 
myself and the other mental health worker really looked um, right, uh, looked at all the longitudinal evidence and very detailed look at all the mental health evidence and then just thinking about how this client consistently manifested to any professional in their life, lawyer or social worker or mental health professional. It was always um, creating some issue to deflect a deeper conversation about what was going on with her. And so when we finally went in front of a judge, I, I was able to talk about how trauma, all these positive cocaine screens and benzodiazepine screens, and um, actually, well, I was able to frame the case as what's been going on here is the deep avoidance to, to complex, um, profound trauma that was documented in the record. We were not going to talk about it at the hearing, but it was there and explained what you saw in this case. So, I mean, that's an example of just avoidance, where uh, the word avoidance was not in any medical record over a 10-year span, but what this client, um, how she had situated herself with her care providers and her family and her professional team, of, of which I was a part, was all about avoidance. She was not going to go there and talk about the trauma she'd been exposed to. Uh, so those are some examples of how symptoms um, come up in the practice of legal services. And on the upside, uh, Amanda is now going to talk to you about uh, resilience. Okay, so um, you know we've talked about the research and science around trauma, talked about how we can see that in generalized symptoms. Um, but as Sarah mentioned, it's important to constantly remind ourselves that this isn't a death sentence for anyone. Um, that you know there are things and protective factors that we can utilize that as a society, as a legal advocate, that can help improve the circumstances. Um, so there's a concept called resilience, um, which is the ability to recover and show early and effective adaptation following a potential traumatic event. Basically, your ability to bounce back. Um, there, the research is pretty significant in terms of what, how do we create resilience, and it's mostly focused in children, um, but we'll talk about you know healing for adults as well. Um, but you know there are certain factors that come into play to help ensure resilience, and Sarah mentioned one of the key ones, which is one single positive adult figure in a child's life can. You know, they can experience eight ACEs, all of those traumatic things, and that one relationship can make the difference, can really help them bounce back um, and have a, you know, and have a healthy, you know, and well, you know, well-rounded future. Um, and there are other factors too, like promoting self-esteem, um, if there are skills that um, someone has, if, if, you know, they're academically, if they're really um, skilled or bright, or if they have, you know, skills with you know, sports or something, like really enhancing that as well. Like those are additional protective factors that we that we know based on science will help protect individuals from the um, effects of trauma long term. Um, and we also know that through research that even as adults that the brain can heal. Um, um, so there's a, you know, this concept, um, and I'm not going to go into it, kind of like Sarah said, you're not here to become scientists, um, but, you know, it's called brain plasticity, um, and it's this idea that, um, well, I idea is this studied phenomenon that brains can actually physically heal um, and evolve and adapt through the lifetime, um, and there are a lot of different treatments and um, things that you might have heard about in your practice. Um, I think you know we've all heard of meditation, um, and you know that that's a very very positive um, intervention to help treat treat the effects of trauma on the brain. Um, dialectical behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy um, is probably I think like the, the therapy du jour in terms of treating these kinds of issues. Um, that really those therapies really look at how do we help someone identify, maybe not go into their trauma so much, but identify how their symptoms are coming out. So how are their emotions recognizing they're constantly in a state of hypervigilance or they're avoiding or whatnot, and then how to self-regulate, how to soothe themselves, um, how to like, build up skills and capacity to kind of counteract that, the effects that their trauma experience has had on themselves. Um, 
And also, we also like to talk about resilience and healing and whatnot to say, you know, yes, as legal advocates, there's a lot we can do to be trauma sensitive and to be a positive and help encourage or, you know, get a protective factor into someone's life. I work with children like Sarah, um, and for example, you know, I find special education case, see there's no, this kid has no one, and so I need to get them a social worker, or I need to get them someone at school or a teacher who's dedicated to this kid, and that, you know, to just get that in, there, in place, so that's how I can legally try and foster resilience. Um, but it also, we all say it's because we're not alone. There's a lot of research, there's a lot, um, going on in the mental health community and broadly to foster resilience, to help build these protective factors, and more so to help communities <laughs> learn how to build protective factors to identify their strengths um, to also protect um, against the effects of trauma. Okay. Um, so, now that we've thrown all the science at you, um, again, we're not asking you to be therapists um, or scientists. So don't panic, you know, you're not gonna sit here and try and diagnose someone. Um, really what we're trying to do is help you develop a base knowledge of what trauma is and how it impacts someone in terms of how they might present to you as a client or to better understand the circumstances they're living in and how that's impacting them. And then give you tools to adjust your practice to both, um, you know, understand that so you can be, you know, more flexible or just more under, you know, just that work a little bit better with your client. Um, or also to actually use your um, services to actually help mitigate effects of trauma. And so we're each going to talk about our projects in, um, individually um, to kind of show you how we've each integrated trauma-sensitive legal care into our um, advocacy, because we've all, we've each done this a little bit differently. Um, so let's, uh, Lisa, go first. So the um, SSI Homeless Outreach Project, we specialize representing people who are homeless and who have a serious mental health condition, including those with co-occurring substance use disorders, um, and uh, specializing in people who have been impacted by trauma. So when I first read the Average Childhood Experiences, um, research and um, you know started keeping up on the news around it I was a bit chagrined at the uh, my perception that the response was um, focused on children it was mostly a pediatric let's organize and stop trauma and help children build resilience um, avoid the later effects of trauma um, when I've been working with a population since the 80s of adults, 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, 6-year-olds, who have been impacted by trauma and had never been um, uh, treated for it, it had never been addressed. And so, so many people in my caseload were impacted by trauma and had then, of course, failed or been pushed out of school into the, um, you know, the, the jail, uh, school-to-jail pipeline. Um, had become using substances at a young age, had um, other high-risk behaviors, after failed school and involvement in criminal justice, um, couldn't get a job, couldn't maintain housing, and were homeless. So I, have, I still feel that our caseload is predominantly people who are so severely impacted by trauma and not, um, not having their needs uh, well addressed. So in our project, we tried to create, I have for the last 10, well, nine years since I came across the research, tried to integrate trauma into our practice. So uh, the staff right now is myself and two paralegals, and we expand our resources as much as possible through law students. Everybody who works in our project is trauma-trained and trauma-informed, and we're constantly trying to build our skills to be, um, you know, we're all works in progress. Um, and we all have room for improvement, but we all bring a, a very um, uh, serious uh, trauma consciousness to our work. We, our goal, is, our, our most specific goal is to help people who are uh, eligible to uh, secure federal disability benefits. And that's for people who are medically disabled, have a severe medical condition so severe they cannot um, performing and civil unskilled work on a full-time sustained basis for those of you familiar with Social Security law. 
So when I first looked, it was a very uh, profound disconnect um, when I was working with clients who I would hear so much of their trauma stories and then, then I would get their medical records and, and there, was, there was no connection there. Um, and their story wasn't being told. And yet in clients' perspectives, so many of them, the most profound um, part of their life and uh, of their illness and their current reality was the trauma that they had suffered. And then they were getting this conventional treatment for depression or they've been diagnosed bipolar. And yet I'm hearing this trauma story and I say, why didn't you talk to your doctor about what you shared with me? And they say, the doctor never asked. And there's actually research around why trauma is so underreported in medical records. One, because, um, uh, longitudinally, because there was no trauma awareness back in the last 20, 25 years. And we do longitudinal, when we're working with people with serious mental illness, particularly those with trauma, we, we develop the record clear back to birth. Um, we go as early as we can to show how things um, started coming together in terms of the client's story. So, um, often it's not the medical records because it was never asked about. Um, it's becoming more and more. There is a movement now within um, physical, mental, and behavioral health um, providers to start um, explicitly addressing trauma. So you're starting to see it now um, reflected in medical records. But in our project, for the most part, there was a disconnect and still is between a client's trauma story and their um, medical records. So in our approach with clients, it's um, utilizing trauma-informed methods. It's, um, uh, I'm gonna let the, uh, Amanda and Sarah talk a, a little bit more about sort of the trauma-informed lawyering piece and what you bring to it. Um, I wanna, what, but what we tried to do is find how we could integrate what we knew about trauma and how impactful it was in our clients' lives on the substantive legal theory of our cases. And so for those of you familiar with Social Security Disability, disability Law, there's a sequential process that you have to go through to prove disability. And when I would look at it, I'd go, it's a child that doesn't go anywhere here unless it's a diagnosis of PTSD. But the further I, I delved and the longer I worked, um, the more I was able to find places to integrate it. And now, whenever I've got to work with a client that has a uh, a case that I think is impacted by trauma, whether it's the one, like I said earlier, where I, I painted the theme of avoidance to the judge so that they would understand the, uh, yeah, the, the problem of relapse in this client's lives um, and ongoing drug use um, in this client's life. Um, I use it throughout the sequential evaluation, evaluation process, and here's how. Uh, Most of the research shows that people who have experienced um, significant childhood and or adult trauma when they have a serious mental illness, their symptoms are more severe. There's really good research on um, trauma impacting severity of psychological symptoms. Your symptoms are more severe. Your symptoms are more intractable. Your symptoms are more complex. You require more uh, sophisticated, intense, and long-term treatment to recover. Um, and so those are the ways I bring to bear the issue of trauma in my, uh, my uh, uh, legal theory of the case. Um, also in Social Security law, there is a whole, um, there is a barrier to receipt of disability benefits if um, it is determined that substance use is material to your disability. And for many conventional lawyers, they consider, like if you're actively using substances, they say, well, you can't win your disability case. And that I've never lost a case because of substance use ever since the new um, standard came into effect. Not at the hearing level anyway. Uh, because in my opinion, the Social Security ruling that addresses the issue of substance use being material to disability, is there's all kinds of ways in that to integrate issues of trauma and establish that under that legal standard, anybody that's traumatized, it goes right to the, the ability to um, cope with stress and adapt to changes in a work environment and to the chronicity and complexity of your condition, even if you stopped using substances. If you have a complex trauma history and you've never developed healthy coping skills, your only coping skills has only ever been use of alcohol or other substances, stopping that substance use altogether completely for the rest of your days is not going to allow you to suddenly have healthy coping skills or be able to adapt to normal work pressures or stress. So um, with research and tenacity, we have really integrated, I, I would say, um, 
very strongly into the legal theory of the case, a, a trauma theory, and um, with that um, being able to educate judges and adjudicators on disability claims. If for those of you who are familiar with Social Security law, there is a new mental health listing that came out in, in January this year, where there is a new trauma-related listing. But that is so limited, it is so specific, um, it still doesn't address the 95% of the clients that I work with and how trauma is going to be integrated into their, um, their, the legal theory of their case. And on a final note in our practice, I would say, um, uh, the, looking at the administrative review, review process. The other thing, not just sort of developing the substantive uh, nature of the case, but also meeting clients, ad addressing trauma throughout the, the attorney-client representation. Um, not, um, if some clients want to tell their story of trauma to a judge, or to an adjudicator, or to a doctor, some do not. And so much is focused, it has to be client choice. Um, I have had hearings where I moved in advance to have the client not have to be present because of uh, trauma-related symptoms and that it would um, uh, make it, that it would be simply intolerable for them. You can take a statement. So looking at whatever venue you're practicing in, whether it's administrative law or state court or federal court or wherever you are, um, think about um, are, if, if, my, if your client is impacted by trauma, are the things that are going to be triggering and really let that client be as much as possible in the driver's seat about um, how they um, participate in that uh, adjudicator process. Um, and I think I've talked a lot. Of, there's one other thing on this on my slide about um, my, what I say, mind the gap. Um, when you're working with clients where, it, it, and which happens often in our cases where we have, um, there's a gap between where the, the client's stated goal on the legal remedy they're seeking, in our case, you know, I want disability benefit, um, and where they are currently, not connected with care, no doctors, no medical treatment, actively using substances, right? So there's a gap between what they've stated as their goal and our ability to get them there. So I, one of the things that we do in our practice often is have integrate in, in um, trauma for a practice uh, in a related vein is motivational interviewing. And that, that's research around, there's all kinds of literature about it on, uh, that you can find online. Wonderful resources, but essentially that's a change conversation when, when that's evocative, that the, it has to come from the other person, from the client. If change is, is a necessary um, um, or a uh, uh, a valuable thing. So for clients, say, who are actively using or not engaged in care or have realized that, wow, they are probably trauma impacted, maybe they, they might want to get some care. Um, the, the, the change conversation is really in, totally client-centered. It's evocative. It's open-ended questions. And it's helping the client understand the difference between um, where we are and where they want to be and laying out the choices available to them to help them close that gap and get to that goal. The research around motivational interviewing showed that people, um, uh, it was originally used for people who were addicted to substances. Motivational interviewing then later was shown to use it for people to enhance um, medication compliance for people with serious mental illness. Um, I would just say generally in the legal services environment, motivational interviewing skills can really help you um, when you're trying to close the gap on um, whatever proof gaps um, or other issues you have between the, the issue, the, the remedy your client is seeking and where the client is now, and really engaging that client in a partnership, understanding the evidence, understanding what the, uh, uh, the, the legal standards are, and what do they think? What do they think? This is where we are, this is where you want to be, this is where I see the problems, these are some of the possibilities I can say, where would you like to go from here? Um, so I'm going to go quickly through this because um, we want to get to actual substance of, you know, here are things you can do or differently. Um, but just briefly, um, the work I do is I partner directly with a mental health provider. So I work with um, an outpatient behavioral health clinic for children um, called Under the Rainbow, and it's based at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, so that class, they serve almost entirely kids who live on the south and west sides of the city. So these are kids who are 100% Medicaid eligible, 100% living in poverty. Um, most of them are facing or dealing with community violence quite regularly. Um, and 80% of them actually have trauma in their diagnosis in addition to their other issues. So it's a very traumatized population. And in addition, 
addition to kind of what Lisa was talking about with motivational interviewing and how I actually physically interact with a client, um, the way I've integrated trauma um, knowledge into my practice um, is I see myself as a tool to mitigate those traumas. So those ongoing cases that might still be happening with the child or you know, um, if there's bullying or homelessness. Um, but what's really kind of unique is that I'm really being driven by the mental health providers. They're the ones who are coming and saying, look, here's this family. They're extremely, you know, they're you know, uh, struggling with these X, Y, and Z. And I can't, my child can't recover. I can't move forward in my treatment. Or simply, like, all I'm doing now is tell, um, trying to work with my clients to, for them, how do I cope with this? Um, and there are often things that, you know, we as legal services providers can fix. Um, so, you know, a kind of homelessness, um, uh, do a lot of special education law. Um, right now, because about 70% of their clients also happen to be mixed status families. Um, my practice has really changed to be a significant um, amount of work in terms of immigration, um, specifically around how do we help families learn how to establish safety plans or how do we protect them because um, the mental health of the, you know, these families, of course, um, has you know, diminished quite a lot, with understandably. Um, so I'm not going to go any more into it because I want to move forward, I'll let Sarah talk a little bit about her practice. Um, and so to illustrate sort of all the different ways that you can adapt this into your practice, um, I'm in a partnership where we don't focus on trauma necessarily. Uh, so we're in a, a medical legal partnership with a group of community health workers and care coordinators at UIC's CHECK program. Uh, and so we've got 40 or around that uh, community health workers doing home visiting for youth uh, between 0 and 26 with chronic illness. So initial diagnoses of asthma, diabetes, sickle cell, or youth who were born premature and have complications following that. Um, and so we handle a full range of civil legal aid issues. Most of our practice falls into special ed, housing, and public benefits issues. Um, and so we're not uncovering trauma, and we don't need to in many of our cases, right? But we can provide a practice, we can provide advocacy that's not going to re-traumatize, right? We can be aware without digging into it. Um, so you can see there's many different ways to, to incorporate this into your practice. Um, of course, sometimes we have to, and so we'll have special ed cases where the only need a student has is because of a trauma. Um, or because of toxic stress or multiple traumas, in which case we're going to talk about that, right? And we're going to try to put in place, for instance, an individualized education plan <coughs> that is trauma informed, um, which is a heavy lift still. And we, we need schools to keep learning this stuff too. Um, so we'll dig into that. Um, but one thing, and can you do two slides ahead, Lisa? Um, to, what to take from this though is that. We don't need to all start screening for ACEs, right? That may be appropriate in the healthcare setting where a doctor needs to address a biological health issue because of past trauma. But for us in the legal aid world, we need to be very careful about when we bring that up and why. And for me, I'm not gonna bring it up unless I'm going to address it. And ideally, we don't wanna bring it up unless there's also mental health experts to provide support um, for what may come up for that patient client. So, don't just scream willy-nilly, right? Don't just add this into your intake. Um, but you can shape your intake to be trauma-informed, and we'll talk in detail about that. Um, and then think about different ways that you can incorporate this, right? From intake to the environment at your office um, to how you close cases. And finally, uh, there's dispute about who, excuse me, who originally said this. Um, but you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic, right? We're not trying to provide treatment, but we can operate in a manner that's going to be therapeutic for our clients. Um, so on that note, um, I also always like to bring everyone a step back because we talk about the research and we talk about the trauma within communities our clients might be facing, but we also have to take a step back and recognize how the legal system itself is a very stressful and very traumatic system to interact with. Um, so 
I won't go into the, the you know, depth just because of time, but um, in the 80s, a couple of lawyers came up with this concept of therapeutic jurisprudence, which says, you know, the, looks at how legal rules, procedures, and the roles of actors constitute social forces that, whether intended to or not, often produce therapeutic or anti-therapeutic um, consequences. And most office and often I think we can agree is anti-therapeutic. Um, and a lot of that are things we can't control. Um, it's larger systemic issues. Um, I think a lot about, I was thinking a lot about um, in the morning presentation about the e-filing issues and um, you know things like that. Those are things that are out of our control. Um, but there are things within our control. So an example of how, um, you can go to the next slide too. Um, I think about therapeutic jurisprudence is I think about, you know, we look at procedural justice, so access to justice, meaning access to these courts and access to lawyers, um, and then substantive justice, like I'm solving a legal issue. Um, but from a, a trauma-informed perspective, that can, those two concepts can, the goal of the client or the needs of the client might look very different from the legal lens that I am looking at. Um, so an example, a very quick example of this, I was working with a, um, fought, uh, I, well, I was, it wasn't my case, but I observed a case um, of a grand, uh, not, uh, sorry, a father um, who with four children, had custody of them, was in court for custody proceedings, or parental allocation now, apparently, as I learned in the new morning session. Um, but. Um, that had recently learned that the youngest of child um, was not biologically his. Now, I knew, and the attorney on the case knew, you know, he was on the birth certificate, he was established as a legal father, um, you know, so that's something we should talk about and we need to talk about. Um, but in that moment, it was a status, we had to get to our next case. It wasn't um, in, the, in our heads as the lawyers, it wasn't something that we needed to talk about and it wasn't relevant in that moment. Um, and so he was dismissed, um, and he and that was very traumatic for him. When all he needed was acknowledgement that yes, this is a very traumatic revelation for you, and we will talk about it, and we will do something to help you either cope with it or you know see what the next steps are. Um, rather than I think as lawyers we frequently kind of dismiss that we don't give the opportunity. Um, and then a final example of that is. Um, I had a client come in um, recently, a mother, um, severe domestic violence in the family. They were now in family court. Um, and I sat there for an hour and she described to me, I told her, tell me, you know, what, what are you, like, tell me what's going on. And she went through the entire thing and it took an hour. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it was like, you know, okay, I'm going to send you these resources. I don't do family law, so I can't directly help you, but I'm going to send you these resources. And she started crying, and she said, no one's let me tell that. No one has said, let me say any of this. And she had worked with a lawyer previously, and that lawyer didn't know this whole thing. So that alone can make a huge difference. Um, so I try and rethink of justice in terms of therapeutic and what the clients actually need and are expecting. Um, so, we're going to go into actually what this looks like, so at your actual tools, so the um, meat of why you came to this. Um, so we, you know, there's different, we categorize these, um, our skills into different categories. So the first being established safety, and I'll be throwing in anecdotes as I go on so you can get an idea of what this looks like in practice. And Sarah and Lisa, I ask that you also, they'll also throw in ten, um, anecdotes, but in terms of establishing safety, considering the physical environment of where you are, um, is it a cold office? You know, what does it feel like to be in there? How where is the client sitting? Are they sitting facing? You know, is there a, a room across the hall that is completely dark and kind of scary? Um, you know, that can have a huge effect on a client and their ability to engage in a conversation with me. Um, for a lot of my families um, who don't live in traditional nucleus families, um, I don't have pictures of my family because that can be very difficult or very traumatic to see when you see something that, you know, that wasn't my, you know, I didn't experience that. And that could distract again from my, their engagement with me. Um, being non-judgmental, non so 
asking, you know, what's happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. Um, you know, when a client um, misses an appointment, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, oh, another no show, like, you know, we're gonna, you know, if you keep doing this, we can't, you know, proceed. Like, yes, we might not be able to proceed if we don't engage, but that doesn't mean that, you know, what, what happened? Is there a way I can help you get to our next appointment? Um, or if not, then we can table it. You know, it took Lisa five years with that one client. You know, we can reestablish that safety to make sure um, that they don't feel like I'm judging them. Continued assurance that everything is confidential. Um, you know, and also acknowledging exceptions. Um, I, I think I'm a little different in this and that I depend entirely on referrals from mental health clinicians that these clients already trust. Um, so I'm walking in with um, kind of a, a recommendation, like, hey, this is someone you can trust. So I, I go into that a little bit differently, but um, you know, wanting to build that safety and trust and ensure that you know what they're about to share with me is protected, and you know, I'm I'm going to protect that information, not just because of the legal, you know, at, you know, requirement that I keep things confidential, but because I understand. These, these stories are are difficult, and if they are valued, and they should be protected. Um, something Sarah does, which I think is fantastic, and I don't do very well, and I do want to do, is um, preview what's coming or laying out an agenda. So, um, and she might you know describe it much better than I can, but she begins her conversations with clients saying, you know, here's what we have to discuss today, X, Y, and Z. Um, so the client knows what's coming, you know, I'm not, sh you know, you're not shocking them with, you know, a difficult conversation, um, and we'll go into it too, but also then giving them the choice of which do you want to talk about first, um, and empowering the client to talk about that legal issue first. Um, and then also looking to alternative sources, so um, a lot, you know, you might not be trying to uncover trauma, um, or, you know, trauma might become important to your legal theory, um, but you know, it, don't sit down and say like, "Tell me all of your trauma." You know that that's not helpful. So you know, when possible, looking to alternative sources that can fill in those gaps for you. Reading, meeting with medical records, but also encouraging in your legal advocacy um, alternative ways. So I always ask when I'm at Social Security hearing the judge to allow the child to be to go first, to talk first, and then come out of the room. Um, so they don't have to hear us going over all of their trauma and difficulties. Um, next. Um, so this is providing, next slide, provide choice. So again, providing options at the start of conversations um, to empower clients. Um, laying out different paths to a client's goal. Um, so, you know, saying, you know, we often, I think as lawyers, think we know best and we know the best route and we know what's going to be helpful. But to make sure, you know, and we have the ethical obligation to do this too, but to make sure we actually lay out, here are all the different goals. I might recommend one, but it is your option. Like, what will work for you? What is the path that you want to pursue? And then I'm just, you know, adapting my legal plan then to that choice. Um, um, never saying you have to do anything. Um, they don't, you know, and I also don't want them to disengage at all. So, you know, they don't have to, I can't think of an exact example, but, you know. Yeah. So often I think we say, if you want this to happen, then you have to do this, right? And that's just like general <laughs> advice to clients that I hear thrown around a lot. And we can reword that and say, if this is your goal, these are the steps to take to get to that goal, and here are a couple other options. And then going through as well, not doing that at all, like totally non-legal options and saying, or you can run out the time on this eviction and keep your family in that unit for as long as you'd like, right? Not just saying what you think the best legal action is. Um, and then finally, passion passing the push away test. So a lot of where that avoidance comes in, you know, clients getting frustrated, like, well, you don't understand, like, you can't help me. Um, and, you know, oftentimes that's a test. They're testing your ability um, to um, acknowledge and be informed of their experiences. Um, so, you know, kind of sitting back and saying, okay, so how, how can I help in another way? Or, you know, just trying to sit back and rethink through um, 
how you might be helping them. Next slide. Um, be trustworthy. Um, set enough time for conversations. Um, I mean, this is hard because there's not enough legal aid. We all know this, we're, we're strapped. Um, but it takes time to be trauma informed. Um, like I said, I sat, you know, I sat for an hour with a person who I ultimately am not going to provide any legal services to. But it, you know, it made a huge difference. And I don't know for sure, but I'm gonna guess that she probably will engage differently with the attorney who can help her because she was able to have a different experience and, you know, in a more trauma informed way. Um, repairing disrupted relationships or acknowledging your own shortcomings out loud. Um, so I have a lot of clients who get frustrated. Um, I try as hard as I can not to make promises I can't keep. Um, so for example, saying like, I will, you know, we have our case meetings on Tuesdays, I'll call you next week with what, we, you know, we think the next step is. Um, and if I don't call, um, that can be really hard. That's another disappointment for this, you know, these clients. Um, so acknowledging that when I reach them saying, you know what, I'm sorry, I did not do what I promised you and I will work to do better for you in the future. Um, so they know that they're valued. Um, we always already said pass the, pay, pass the push away test. Um, laying out process and communications and expectations. That can also help prevent some of those disruptions later. Um, but you know, immediately um, talking through, you know, if you want to reach me, you can reach me this way. I'm generally available at these times. I'm not available then. Um, so they have a general framework. Um, and they'll probably, you know, they might ignore it anyway and reach out to you anyway. Um, but being able to go back to that and have um, consistency and being consistent, being available during those times when you've already promised that you are, if you can, as much as you can. Um, again, keeping promises, like I said, I'm still, you know, struggling to do this, um, in terms, especially in terms of when promising timelines and when I will return a phone call. Um, and keeping, so that, so that's another way of being trauma sensitive is you know when I call a client back now I'm being more proactive and thinking through okay what can I reasonably get back to them in a week if I if I don't need like say it's not urgent can I reasonably get back with them a week if I'm being not no I'm not going to so having that conversation with myself beforehand to then have that conversation with the client so I can be give, um, be more reliable with my promises. Um, and no silver linings. Um, clients, um, I found in my practice especially, um, are very appreciative of just telling them straight out, look, you know, I, you know, this really kind of sucks. You know, there's not, I can't stop your eviction. It's not going to happen. You know, not giving them a silver lining. You know, just making sure you're acknowledging their reality um, and not acting like it's not. You know, that the reality is something different. Yeah, never start a sentence with that. It's like Sarah. But at least you have your health, right? <laughs> never do that when you're trying to be sensitive, right? You're empathizing. And so sometimes you have to, if you haven't seen that Brene Brown video, you have to climb down and sit with the person in whatever is not going well for them. And it's actually a much stronger point and a much, um, you're, you're showing yourself to be an ally when you're not saying at least you're going to be X, Y, or Z. Um, next, um, having a very collaborative relationship with your client. So Lisa kind of went over this with motivational interviewing, which I definitely encourage you to look into more resources on. Um, but asking open-ended questions um, and giving the space and time for the client to give their story. Um, so I very frequently um, at Loom House, we don't have a, we have a general intake, you know, questions, but it's not like in a, it's not in a legal server. I don't have to ask these questions, like it's a framework. And I leave my intake very open-ended. I say like, okay, I received a referral for you. The clinician mentioned that you might be having some housing difficulties. How can I help you? Um, and they might start with the housing. They might start with something else. But I might ask questions about something that's sensitive. Um, usually it's when immigration is coming up. Um, and they'll hesitate or they won't answer. Um, but after a half hour, then they go back to it. This has happened several times. They'll readdress it once they feel more settled or more safe with me. Um, so allowing that space and time for them to 
to answer your questions. Um, acknowledging their goals and how that relates to your legal issue. Um, so you know, Sarah kind of, we kind of talked about that. Um, again, emphasizing choice, even with small things, where would you like to sit in this room? Like you, where do you want to sit? Instead of saying you can sit here, you know, that, you know, maybe that, that's not a great place for them. Maybe that's not where they want to sit. Um, making sure they're comfortable. Um, how do you want to meet? Do you want to talk on the phone or do you want to meet in person? For me, it's always what's the easiest way to meet, and it's always 100% at the clinic. Um, so I have not once met with a client at my legal office. It's always been at the hospital clinic. Um, so giving them those kinds of choices as well. Um, and then from the beginning, frame your part, your representation as a partnership. You know, you know, I'm here to work with you. Like, let's work together and figure out how we can solve these issues. Like, how can we get you to a the next step or um, whatnot. Um, and then encourage, um, so affirming all successes and achievements no matter how small or indirectly related to the legal issue. And this is something when I first started practicing um, that I really struggled with because you know, I had an idea of you know, here's the legal issue and here's the legal remedy and um, here's what I think the solution is. Um, and there have been times where I didn't get the client what they needed in a special education case, you know, I wasn't able to, um, or a um, expulsion issue where I wasn't able to hold a charter school accountable, but I did, you know, I was able to negotiate them going to CPS without an expulsion on their record or something. Um, and acknowledging, like, for that family, like, I was frustrated because I was like, oh, I want to hold the school accountable, um, but the client was thrilled. Um, so acknowledging that you know they are going, there are going to be things that we do that we might not see as a success, um, that to them will be a huge success, and to giving them that space to express that and to encourage it. That, you know what, you're right. We were able to accomplish this together, and we were able to do this X, Y, or Z. So again, recognizing client wins even when they're not legal wins, um, especially I think that can be hard for if. A client when ultimately they back out of a legal representation because that's not their final goal. They, you know, stuff has changed what they want. Um, and then also, um, you know, using affirmative language and, you know, how did you do so well? You know, that sounds very stressful. How did you do so well during that? Um, and empowering them for, so also doing this to empower them for their future needs. So kind of going back to when we talk about the science of resilience, um, you know being a tool to be a positive um, figure that they're interacting with so in the future that they can they might feel more empowered um, with their needs and i don't know if sarah at least have any more, more examples but we do have a role play i don't know we're, we're we have about five minutes okay let me know. <laughs> um, ooh, five minutes. um so we'll jump into this lisa can you go ahead yes. the um the role play. So let's read quickly through it. You have an intake scheduled with Bernard. He's a 68 year old vet um, for later this afternoon. He reports his landlord has verbally threatened to kick him out on the street. The appointment was just scheduled yesterday, um, but since then the receptionist tells you he's called eight times, inquiring about different actions he should take in the meantime, right before this afternoon when you're going to meet with him. Um, you were in court though on another matter and, and weren't aware of the calls piling up which made him really frustrated and angry. Um, when you get out of court, you call him back and he demands to see you immediately. He says, if you don't see him now, his entire life will fall apart. Um, so I'm gonna actually uh, skip through your wonderful participation <laughs> and give you the answers. <laughs> that nice. um, so the idea here, if we're gonna be trauma sensitive, um, the goal is to give him information that's gonna help him de-escalate right away with the phone call. So you're not gonna avoid him any longer, you're gonna call him right away, but you're also hoping that you can calm him down so that by the time you do meet, you can have a more productive meeting. Um, so I actually first start with, this is the kind of dedication that is gonna serve you so well in your case and in life. And I think as lawyers, we really fail at that. We fail to encourage our clients on the little things about their personality that are gonna help them succeed. Um, so that's my first thing. Um, second, uh, and, and also saying that perseverance is going to help your case, that's part of the collaboration, 
right? Helping him recognize that he is an equal team member. Um, then I'm gonna offer some transparency, and I'm gonna promise to talk through all of his concerns this afternoon and his options with his landlord. I'm establishing trust by explaining that I care a lot about his case and maintaining his housing, that I'm gonna meet with him today because we agreed to it and it's on my calendar, um, and I'm prepared for that meeting. Uh, then we're going to get some predictability in there um, in high tension situations by describing details. Um, so I will talk to my clients about the lobby structure and how many doormen there are and where the elevators are and who our receptionist is. Just little details and I say you don't have to remember all this but I just want you to know what to expect, right? So that we're removing some of the uncertainty of his situation. Um, also, this call is not the time to address his inappropriate communications, right? We're gonna do that later when he's calmed down. Um, hopefully you had that conversation at the beginning of representation and said, sometimes I'm gonna be unreachable, but I always return my phone calls. Feel free to leave a voicemail with your name. Um, if you call a bunch of times, I may not know unless there's a voicemail, right? Do you say that to your clients? That's an important one, right? Um, and then finally, I don't engage on his life falling apart. So at the end, he said, my life is gonna fall apart if you don't meet with me immediately. Um, I can address all of the things that I can address without invalidating his perception about the severity in his life, right? So there are things that I'm gonna address, but there are things that I'm not. I'm not a mental health provider. I can be a therapeutic person on the legal issue. Um, okay. So, um, I don't, I think we'll have enough time. I want to make sure we also have time for questions because I think that's important. Um, Self-care is what we would talk about next, and that's extremely important for us, especially as lawyers, because I think we're notoriously bad at self-care. Um, there is another session um, about vicarious trauma next, so if you, I encourage you to go to that um, because it is very important, especially when dealing with traumatized um, populations and how it can impact you. Um, but we'll um, go straight to um, if there are any questions. Yes. Uh, just uh, do you have any general tips on helping people through the trauma of their legal um, situation when we can't achieve a result that's acceptable to them? Because often that is the case we feel that um, we can't solve the problem and just not being able to help our professional, it's difficult to know how to comfort them through bad news, basically. She wins too many cases to answer that question. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I can answer that question. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you can stick with it. It sucks. You know. I mean, not to not to put a silver lining. It sucks. It's and it can be deeply uncomfortable to be uh, to share someone's misery, and especially lawyers. I think because we're all trained to solve a problem, and we can't solve it. It sucks. Um, so just being there with your client and, and acknowledging um, that there is injustice and um, uh, every wrong does not have a legal remedy and that is really awful. And saying that at the start and throughout. I have some clients where in every phone call I have with them I remind them that we're up against something that we may not win. Not in every case, right, but in some cases I have to say that every day. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you mentioned, Amanda, you mentioned um, the fact that this woman you spoke with who served to hold something very traumatic about her life was really grateful in this hour long conversation with her and about that you weren't able to help her. She was grateful to tell her story. I'm curious to what degree, as someone who also runs in the data center organization, to what degree is people divulging their story but then being told we can't help you? Traumatic in and of itself. Uh, I know that we're kind of reevaluating our intake procedures and trying to screen better at the beginning of the call to avoid that, both to respect everyone's time, but also because we don't want people to feel as if they've just poured their whole life into something and you know, we just shut down. So, if those in here, the question was um, especially in connection to the example I gave of the woman who I spoke with for an hour and ultimately didn't help with her legal matter. Um, I think, again, it goes back to the predictability. I always start those conversations 
um, before I say, okay, now let's talk through how, like what's going on, how can I help you? Um, I always, I go through my spiel, you know, I go through attorney-client privilege, I go through confidentiality. Um, I also go through, you know, I might not be able to help you at the end of this conversation, um, but let's talk about what's going on to see if there's anything we can do. Um, and like I said, sometimes it's not, so I had an intake, I did, um, I wasn't ready to take particular, but it was pretty quickly in our, you know, figured out that I could not prevent this grandmother who had adopted four children from being evicted. Like, there was no defense that she was going to get evicted. Um, and that sucked, and that was really, really hard. I really, I personally, and that's why you should go through vicarious trauma training, I personally struggled with it a lot, and you know, I started to pick up how I've been, you know, how I'm starting to experience secondary trauma, because I started trying, you know, avoiding having that conversation, you know. Um, and that's very hard. And I think you just living with it, um, having tools for self care. So when you do have to have those difficult conversations, but also being predictable, um, not making promises you can't keep, and being sure that they know from the beginning, um, I might not be able to help you. And in my work too, with the um, clinicians I partner with, also training them that when they tell them they're making a referral to me, that they're not giving them a magic solution, that they're giving this referral to say, I don't know if there's anything that can happen, but let's talk more to lawyers to see what, what there might be. I would add to that too, um, this may not work if you're doing like LAF intake where you're seeing every issue ever, um, but for instance, in our practice, we know that we're not gonna go to DB court, and so we actually don't try to create a rapport with that client, we'll say, we heard you're really having trouble, we wanna connect you with this organization, the folks there are great, so that we're avoiding any kind of retelling in those circumstances. And we do that throughout, we use the medical record, we use school records, we use records to avoid people telling those kinds of stories and just get the broad outlines as often as possible. And I'll just clarify, I think um, that, yeah, that's what we do too, I, I'm not going to um, make a client go through their story, um, just when I get to the beginning, there's nothing I can do. Um, it's just in those circumstances where you know the legal issue is referred as one thing and turns into a much different issue, um, and letting them go through it. <coughs> Any other questions? I know we're at that mark. There's a yeah, in the back. Question in the back. You mentioned early on about the culture of trauma-informed practice, and so I've experienced on an institutional or educational level. <laughs> How as an institution, like you thank you so much, it's a wonderful job of providing individual participants. And I'm just curious on an organizational level, how the organization is culture. Go a couple slides ahead to organizational. So we think about it in the supervision relationship, um, or I try to, I have two supervisees here, and I hope I do this for you, but I try to check in with them and actually ask how they're doing. Um, and when things are too stressful, I rejigger their intakes, they don't know that. Um, <laughs> but I do. Um, and then if you can go another one ahead, Lisa. Organizationally, um, so we, we've been talking about and trying to get trauma, this kind of trauma training for everyone in our organization. Um, we recently moved at the legal council, so we had a blank slate, and we tried to make our offices, our office space, our reception area, and our client intake rooms really trauma sensitive. So. Um, there, there aren't rooms with lights off, theoretically. You can always see into rooms, but there's still confidentiality. Um, there's like shelves and nice lighting and things that are make it, gonna make it feel non-clinical and non-incarceral. Um, we try to celebrate the successes. Amanda and I try not to traumatize each other <laughs> with um, stories. And so you'll hear today, we didn't give you any gory details, right? And we try not to spread that around. Um, uh, our intake is trauma-informed, so we've created, on my project, we have a bunch of different intakes, and we have worked trauma-informed phrasing into that intake. Um, and then, I think methods for self-care are really important, so de-traumatizing with a specific group. So if I work with kids, so I try to hang out with kids who are, where at least we're not talking about trauma, we're not talking about how much life sucks and how hard it is. Um, we're talking about plies and tendons and ballet. Um, and I think that's a really important one as an organization to think about too. So there's a little bit more info in here. You'll see actually through this entire slide deck, um, most of these photos are meant to be de-biasing to us in terms of our client population. 
So the, the ideas of debiasing from implicit bias apply here to trauma, where we don't want to start to internalize it and think that every kid in the world is sick. Um, but surrounding yourself with these ideas that can help you deal with the trauma. Uh, and that can lead to, you know, when we say celebrate the little wins for your clients, uh, celebrate your little or big wins too, acknowledging them. Um, something that the therapists, like, you know, and their therapists are very good at doing all this, um, but something that they do at the beginning of every staff meeting um, is they ask, you know, is it, they don't ask us usually, um, people volunteer, like, you know, this other therapist helped me with, you know, clean, you know, clean my office when there was a spill, and I really appreciated it. Um, or in our case meetings, um, there have been times where our supervisor has um, said, you know what, Sarah had this huge win um, that I wouldn't have known about if she hadn't, you know, but, you know, being able to celebrate that with each other, too, can also help create a more trauma-sensitive environment. So, thank you all. Thank you.